<coughs> Shall we begin? Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's wonderful to have uh, everyone here today, and uh, it's uh, such a great day, uh, Mother's Day. So, happy Mother's Day to everyone. And we are in the uh, in the grace of the Divine Mother, so it's a very appropriate uh, setting to be in. <coughs> and uh, my name is Giri. I live here in the ashram, and uh, we'll be talking uh, about uh, Vedanta. Begin with a small prayer. <coughs> oh. Asato ma sadgamaya Tamaso ma jyotir gamaya Mrityor ma amritam gamaya Om shanti 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 So today's topic is actually Om, uh, a Vedantic, uh, what's the Vedantic perspective on the central, uh, the, it's such a central concept in any yoga, not just in any yoga, all the four yogas, Bhakti Yoga, Karma Yoga, Gnana Yoga, Raja Yoga, not just the Hindu religion, any Indic religion, uh, Om is the one concept that is universally accepted within the various uh, religious forms. Even the most recent one, which is uh, the Sikh religion, uh, it came around 12th, 13th century. Even they subscribe to the concept of Ik Onkar, that Onkar is the ultimate truth. <coughs> So we'll dwell a little on the Vedantic aspect of it and uh, what's, the, uh, what's the importance of Om and uh, how, to, how Om can be used in our everyday life uh, toward working toward our spiritual goal. <coughs> but before that, uh, we'll just do like a quick recap. I'm sure you all have uh, some kind of streaming services, right? Netflix, HBO, stuff like that. So when you start watching a show, before the beginning of each new episode, they do like a quick recap, no? Like uh, they show you everything that has passed and then you move on. So in the same way, we'll just do a quick recap. Uh, we've been doing these classes for uh, a couple months now. And uh, we've been talking about <coughs> what is the meaning of Vedanta? the literal meaning of Vedanta, what are some core concepts, what are some core Vedantic concepts, what have been the core texts. Uh, Vedanta has three main texts, they call it uh, Prasthana Traya. Prasthana literally means <coughs> uh, a pole, a pillar uh, in, uh, in Sanskrit. Traya is three. So the three main pillars of Vedanta is uh, of course the Upanishads, the Bhagavad Gita, and the Brahma Sutras. So all the knowledge encapsulated, uh, the Vedantic concepts are encapsulated in this Prasthana Trayas. And then there have been like various commentaries on uh, these um, major texts and they have uh, all culminated into this one body of knowledge of Vedanta and it still continues to this day. And we talked about uh, last class, uh, well, last gathering, we talked about uh, what are some of the practices for, uh, for Vedantic thoughts to make it real in our life. Sadhana Chatushtaya, like uh, the, what are the fourfold practices? Viveka, 
vairagya shamadhamadi shat sampatti and mumukshatva we went into detail in the last gathering yeah 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 i know this is just uh, yeah yeah we're still uh, we're still in the past and then even though time itself is illusionary we'll come to that momentarily <coughs> so from that we are uh, dwelling into the concept of om today why i uh, particularly started with the last uh, class uh, the last gathering was that <coughs> the very first principle like a practicing principle for vedanta is viveka viveka in sanskrit means well a good translation into english would mean discernment how do you discern the real from the apparent how do you discern the rational from the irrational how do you discern the reality from illusion viveka discernment and there are various different uh, approaches of discernment too <coughs> uh some of the vedantic uh, approaches to discernment is there is one called avasthatraya and then there is the other one that we are that we all are uh, more familiar with especially in uh, the context of yoga is the panchakosha annamaya kosha pranamaya kosha manomaya kosha vignanamaya kosha anandamaya kosha so this very concept what are we doing there we are discerning we are uh, in in many ways we are differentiating the different aspects of the experience of the experience of the body the experience of the breath the experience of the mind the experience of the intellect and where all of it merges into anandamaya kosha and then vedanta takes the next step as to who is experiencing all of this that's the <coughs> uh that's the panchakosha viveka and then you have the avasthatra viveka and then there's another beautiful method called the drig drishya viveka the seer and the seen we always are fond of saying philosophy is a subjective uh field right we keep on saying subjective and then when we talk of science we say science is objective drig drishya viveka actually dwells deep into this very same aspect it makes a clear distinction between what is an object and then dwells deeper into the subjective experiences like in academia right we are, when we take all these classes <coughs> we constantly hear professors say pro at least in this academia here even in my own experience i have seen that people tend to keep a distance from subjective interpretations the moment it touches something about emotions something about personal experience especially in social sciences they go oh that's a subjective experience and we'll leave it at that and we'll stick to the objective the indian traditions made it their business to dwell deep into the subjective and apply this viveka into the subjective aspects <clears throat> and that's another uh, and the method is called drig drishya viveka which also connects beautifully to the concept of the vedantic concept of om which we'll do and in fact at the uh, toward the end of the lecture we'll also do like a small little vedantic meditation exercise to just to illustrate how it works <coughs> i still not started about om i know uh, there's a lot of uh, it's a lot of background that goes uh, into <coughs> so the form of om itself <coughs> will dwell into the logistics of it first we'll get that out of the way and then see how each individual uh each individual uh, sound of om corresponds to what <coughs> now om is a combination of four distinct sounds hmm. the fourth one is debatable if it's a sound or not we'll come to that so the <coughs> you would have heard of it already right the first sound is a uh, the second sound is oo the 
third sound encapsulated in there is mm, and there's a silence that for fo that follows the mm sound so om is that encapsulation of four distinct sounds a u mm the silence now the proper way of actually chanting it is om do not split it into the constituent sounds because the rules of grammar rules of sanskrit grammar dictates when you have the a sound and then when the u sound precedes the a it becomes it transforms into o so even though om is a combination of a u m you always have to chant it as one Om. Om. Because when you are saying Om, without having to spell out, the acoustics are already producing the three sounds that are encapsulated. So that's the logistics of the chanting itself, right? <clears throat> now that we have that out of the way, let's just look at the where does Om originate from? It has like very ancient origins. the one text where we get a very clear delineation of what om stands for is from an upanishad and that's the mandukya upanishad now those who are uh, familiar with uh, mandukya upanishad you'll know it's a very short upanishad it's uh, it's about uh, comprises of, of about 11 12 mantras that's it and in this upanishad they have actually uh the uh the rishis who create uh, who had the vision of mandukya upanishad the concept of om is very clearly laid out <coughs> uh remember when i said the first one the methods of discernment the first one that i mentioned was avastha traya avastha in sanskrit means state state of being and then traya there are three states of being and then there is one added state the fourth which is the true self so in re so mandukya upanishad the mantra goes that you who are brahma your true self tatvamasi you have four aspects of which the three aspects are the ones appearing to the fourth the fourth is called the thuriya now just contrast that to om as i just mentioned om also has four syllables a u m and the silence so the idea is mapping those four aspects of brahman the existence onto the four syllables of om and how that becomes the path for enlightenment so done properly you don't need any other tools any other spiritual uh practice just practicing om is a sure shot of getting on the path of enlightenment how obviously that's the most obvious question you know i have to say this <clears throat> the most obvious things are usually the easiest to miss i learned this i learned this most days <laughs> i keep on learning this more from moksha priya than anyone else you know the many days i come here wednesday mornings i come here and then moksha priya's car would be right outside you know i would walk right past moksha priya's car and then when she comes out i accept oh i didn't know you were there and the first thing moksha priya goes didn't you see my car outside 
even well part of the reason is that i'm already hurrying at 629 to reach here at 630 that that, that could be the cause <laughs> but 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 the car is right there you know i walk past it and still i don't realize oh i cannot put two and two together and say oh moksha priya drives the car upstate the car is here and yet when i see moksha priya i act surprised oh i didn't know you were here <laughs> and that's why we need gurus that it is exactly why we need gurus because the the guru is the one who points you to the most obvious that we are missing the most so in the same way mandukya upanishad it spells out the most obvious experiences of her life it doesn't talk about any mystic experience it doesn't talk about the one thing about vedanta right is it is not a concept that you are going to achieve it's not about time it is not about space in the sense that it's not about oh you are going to achieve enlightenment after death or after so and so many years after 20 years of hard tapasya you are going to achieve no 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 it says it's with you it's you right now vedanta is not also about space it doesn't ask you to go on a pilgrimage it doesn't ask you to go to himalayas it doesn't ask you to go to kashi or jerusalem or any other space it's here with you right now and that is what we are going to explore how and it is the mo because it is here with us every single minute that is why it's so easy to miss the most obvious and we'll see how we are we'll see how how to dwell on the most obvious now i mentioned about the three states of existence right in Sa i'll say it in sanskrit and then translate it to english <coughs> jagrata swapna sushupti jagrata is the most obvious of all the states and the most obvious of what we think as existence which is this we are awake you know we are awake we are conscious and uh, with some chai or coffee we feel more awake <laughs> are more are more conscious you know and for the most part we think oh this is real life right oh yeah this daylight whenever we are awake we are gathering experience we are having sensory experience all the five senses are active and uh, this is me living jagrata <coughs> and then we have the swapna what happens when uh, when this movie stops we, there's another movie that starts playing you know the, the late night version which is the sleep we start dreaming all the experiences that we have been bombarded with when we are awake are being reprocessed are being like stored some are being discarded some are being processed the mind is a relentless machine it keeps going on and on and on and on and on and gives us and gives that experience in the form of dreaming we we keep on dreaming and that's the swapna swapna avastha and then something interesting happens after the dream is done right all of us also experience this period of blankness no deep sleep deep sleep where even the dreams cease to exist and we think it is blank we going to like all all cultures have this concept of how did you sleep today i slept like a log i slept like a log means oh i did not Uh, th there was not even any dreams and that's when we feel the most rejuvenated now some might call it blankness it's not a blank experience it's the experience of the blank it's not nothingness it's the experience of nothingness which also corresponds to the anandamaya kosha so it's lines are very thin and this and this state is called the sushupti the third state now 
the awake, the dream, the deep sleep. It is all appearing to the true you. You who are not the mind, the body, not the blankness, but the one who is witnessing the blankness, that is you, the true you, Tattvamasi. When they say Aham Brahmasmi, Tattvamasi, it is that beyond blankness is what is being referred. Not the waking state, not the dream state, not the deep sleep state, the one witnessing all of this all the time. Now, how do we map this on to Om? The way it goes, <coughs> when you are chanting Om, you are still chanting Om, but when you are chanting Om, remember the first syllable is A, right? You map the A onto the waking state. So when you close your eyes and when you chat Om, in your mind, you are mapping A onto the waking state. U onto the dream state. Mm, onto the blank state and then dwell deeply on the silence. Oh. And feel the silence resonate with your true self. It's such a contradiction that the moment you start speaking, it's gone. <laughs> it's like that silence is the true you. But the moment I open my mouth, here we are again in, in the Maya. So you see how all these concepts, the concept of Maya, the concept of the three states, the concept of the true self, uh, all these quote unquote complex, seemingly concept, complex ideas are so beautifully encapsulated in this one sound and not even a sound. The sounds that lead to the silence, it's all encapsulated there and it leads to the true you who's right here with you, it's, it is you. Now a distinction has to be made here since I also studied linguistics. You know, in linguistics, they have something called a word boundary, you know, in continuous speech. If I break up every word that I'm speaking, see, there's a blank. There has to be like a, the space we give when we type each word, right? That too can be perceived as a silence after each word, no? But no, that's a gap. And then, when we say the word it, is, or any word, right, the silence is not factored into the word. It is only for the logistical purpose of making sense that the silence follows at the end of each word. However, it's different in the case of Om. In the case of Om, the silence, the, the whole purpose of Om is the silence, quite contrary to regular words. And the whole idea is 
that sound ultimately all the sounds that we make even the om sound should make us merge into the true silence so that's the idea of om and of course you can also do this with yoga you know there's so many different ways you can also uh, when you are uh, when you are uh, doing the breathing exercises you can do that in the form of om and then you can uh, so uh, in many creative ways like when you are doing the asanas and the different stages of the asanas you can give the pause and then connect it to the silence it that's the whole idea of uh it's there for you to make it your own but just make sure that oh wait i'm sorry it felt there yes yeah F yeah and then we'll do question and answers yes so yes so that's the whole uh, concept of even though we say time is an illusion i just got the signal <laughs> that, that, that that we live <laughs> we live we live in the lived reality of the illusion so <coughs> just one last thing since we are, since we have 5 minutes right we could actually try doing a meditative technique of vedanta which is also connected to the concept of om <coughs> it's called the drig drishya viveka remember when i mentioned drig drishya viveka <coughs> so for it it's very simple so we'll start with the simplest step you can either do it with eyes open or eyes closed actually it's preferred that you have your eyes open that way it's uh just choose any object of uh, any object of interest you know let's say well beautiful crystal right let's look at the crystal right <coughs> so just observe the crystal so what is the crystal it's an object no good so now the crystal has entered your awareness now as you keep your awareness on the crystal ask yourself who is doing the seeing what organ is doing the seeing the eyes so as keep the keep the gaze on the crystal and now shift your awareness to your eyes hold the gaze and then shift the awareness to your own eyes that is looking at the crystal now as you're looking at the crystal as you're observing the eyes something is happening inside you which is processing all the information so bring awareness hold the gaze hold the attention on the eyes and shift the awareness to your mind so this is where it gets a little tricky you already have three layers here you have the crystal you have the eyes and you have the mind now map it on to om Oh Oh The silence at the end is the one witnessing the crystal the eyes and the mind Hari Om. That's the that's the Vedantic uh, that's the Vedantic approach to Om. <coughs>